This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. And today we are going to be speaking with Doris Sumner, who is the president of Empowering Gender Opportunities. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of things, but notably uh, combating sexism and uh, discrimination uh, in employment and other areas. Uh, and uh, she is going to be uh, very helpful to, uh, to people, uh, whether as individuals uh, or uh, organizations and businesses uh, facing this problem. Welcome, Doris. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic. Thank you. Well, first of all, tell us a, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I retired from the Army National Guard last year, so I'm in retirement status, and that's a, that's a great privilege to have. And I am working on a book, writing a book, and I launched Empowering Gender Opportunities, my business, last year, which is a diversity consulting business. So although I'm retired, I'm very busy, um, live at home with my son, who's 22, going to college, my husband, who's a retired veteran as well, and I have a five-year-old granddaughter. So that's what's going on with me. Great. Well, tell us about your experience with the Guard and, uh, and maybe how that uh, impacted on the, the uh, post uh, or the retirement uh, profession uh, you're doing now. Yes, so I spent 36 years of my life in the Army, but the last 13 years I was the state equal employment manager. So I process discrimination cases, and the, the bulk of my work was, um, or the bulk of my cases was sexual harassment and gender discrimination. And so um, part of being an EEO manager is helping the adjutant general create command climates where people want and uh, can thrive uh, regardless of who they are, regardless of their gender or their uh, nationality or race. And so some of the issues in the military around sexual harassment, unfortunately, they've had a long, long history of sexual harassment and sexual assault issues, is that the military still ma is male majority. It's 85% men. And it's not that all men uh, sexually harass or anything, but it creates this culture where it's very um, predominantly masculine. So those who join, uh, in order to be successful, must assimilate. So there is a disadvantage for women. And um, so the cases that came before me, it was very challenging to, um, because the, the solution was to change the culture. And it's uh, hard to change a culture that is uh, centuries old and has operated. Uh, women have been in the Guard since 1972. So although we've been in the Guard 50 years, the representation of women in power positions, those who are influential, uh, has, has remained um, very underrepresented. So uh, that's what uh, inspired me to really take a look at the problem of having less women in the power core. And um, yeah, so it's inspired me to uh, really focus on gender. And oftentimes when people think of diversity, they think of race. And especially in Vermont, they think of, oh, we don't, we don't have diversity because Vermont's the whitest state in the nation. But uh, diversity is so much more than race. And another uh, thing that I find is people don't think of gender as a culture. And they think, well, I don't care if you're male or female, I just care that you're a competent worker. But uh, right from the get-go, gender expectations for boys and girls um, socializes differently. And so that shows up in the workplace and specifically in those workplaces where it's been predominantly men for centuries or decades. And so women um, who enter those sort of occupations are coming at it from their feminine lens and their feminine feminine socialization, but um, because it's male majority, they are asked to assimilate to a male culture. So that's kind of the never-ending problem: mm -hmm. is uh, trying to balance balance those two worlds. Well, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this for people who might not be as familiar. What is really the status of uh, 
gender discrimination uh, in Vermont? Uh, how pervasive is it? Or, or even talking nationally? I mean, yeah. We seem, well, to be, we seem to be one of the few countries in the world that has never had a, uh, a female head of state or head of government, uh, yeah. as in Britain and Canada and other, other Germany, of course, other places, uh, and the so-called number one position in the country. But maybe just talk about uh, this in Vermont from the corporate level and, and the government level and any levels you have experience with. Well, Vermont Change the Story is a huge organization who um, has put out annually reports about uh, the gender disparity and the wage gap between men and women and the economic um, impacts of that. And so uh, in their latest uh, report that they uh, produced last year, they uh, document how polls estimate a third of women in the United States experience sexual harassment. So it is uh, globally, it is nationally, it is, um, it is part of our uh, command climate, it's part of our climate that sexual harassment is very pervasive and very harmful. And it doesn't just happen to women. Uh, obviously men are victims of sexual assault and sexual uh, harassment as well too. But predominantly has affected women because um, it's all about who's in power and who's in control. And so that's why gender equality is so important um, to have both men and women uh, be part of the organization's decisions and command climates um, because that's going to minimize the sexual base offenses that happen. So it definitely uh, impacts all of us every day and uh, I, I speak from the military frame of reference because that's where I grew up, that's where my professional life was, but I do recognize that it is everywhere. It is uh, in the grocery stores, it is in the fast food, it is in corporate America, and uh, law enforcement, it's everywhere. And so uh, our attention to it, because oftentimes our gender bias is very unintentional and is very unconscious. Um, the things that we say or the expectations that we have. And so that's why having conversations about it and raising our awareness helps us be more intentional when we're, when we're um, creating teams, when we're working on teams, when we're in charge of teams. And uh, I think it's going to, there's all kinds of evidence to show the more we're diversified, the better products that we have, the better command culture we have, and the less negative impacts that we have. So. Well, is it, is it about uh, numbers or is it about money or is, is it about authority? Uh, how many different areas does this involve? Because uh, someone might point out that uh, uh, the idea of racial discrimination in this country in certain regions might seem passe, and it's so obvious if it occurs. Uh, how does this uh, discrimination occur? How subtle is it, really? Yeah. Well, it's very, um, it's, it's very subtle in a lot of ways. Uh, the term you guys is one thing that people just generally say, well, I know you mean men too, but the, the term actually comes from a male pronoun, the, guy, the word guy, but women are just much more, um, you know, willing to say, I know you mean me too, instead of to say, I would like to be recognized. Whereas if we said you gals, um, men might say, I'm not a gal and reject that. And so uh, be more attentive to the words that are coming out of our mouth. And and when you talk about racism and other forms of discrimination, I focus on gender because gender crosses all forms of diversity, uh, regardless of your color, your ethnicity, your religion, your economic status. Um, gender is, you know, an identity um, that all human beings take on, and and there are uh, an increased uh, number of people who don't want to identify as a binary, either male or female. Um, so that's, that's a trend that's happening. Um, but we have this long historical um, gender expectation um, bias that happens. So it's very subtle in, in the way that it shows up in our work centers and how we treat each other. And uh, little things, even, even using intentional words, um, to identify somebody makes such a difference. I'm feeling empowered and feeling um, appreciated and wanting to stay there and do a good job for that employer or that team. Uh, 
just recognizing somebody makes such a difference. Well, how much of this is, is sort of culturally inherited and, uh, or maybe geographically inherited? Uh, how, how do you deal with that kind of mindset? Yeah, that's, you know, and again, I don't think my one book or my one voice is going to change the world, but I want to be part of the solution and having that because it is globally, there has always been um, the issue of a disparity between feminine and masculine and uh, women have more negatively been impacted by that disparity. And so on my website, it's all about ego. Um, it truly is. It's okay to have a healthy ego. It's good. But when we have an ego where we, we think we're superior to another person, uh, regardless if that's I'm superior because I'm, I'm uh, you know, Catholic and you're Jewish or because I'm white and you're black or because I'm male and you're female, whatever our superiority, ego, um, we start oppressing others for who they are. And so when we think about ego, uh, we think about when we feel good about ourselves and who we are, uh, we also must feel good about who other people are and what they bring to the team. And it may be very different from what I have. And so I do think it's a lot uh, about ego. It's all about ego and um, being okay with who we are so that we can lift other people up. And that's, that's really hard to change because our world was really built on ego. Yeah. <laughs> so how do we change egos? Uh, through humility and through practice and through intentional acts. And so, again, my, my book and my business is all about bringing those uh, conversations into teams to think about how am I respecting you? How am I valuing you? Even though you're very different from me and you see things from a different lens. Um, I, want, I want to engage with you and I want to uh, benefit from what you can bring to my team, to my business and uh, versus here, a simulate, be like me, and you'll, you'll, you'll be just fine if you're just like me. And, and we devalue people when we do that. Well, how does this uh, uh, interact with, with the, the other uh, categories, uh, transgender, uh, gay, and, and other people who, who uh, are, are in a, are they in a different category or is this just the idea, uh, the idea is to treat people as you would treat yourself? no discrimination, no bias, none of that. Yeah, certainly the uh, transgender community, the LGBT community um, are impacted by sexism. Because again, we come from a long history of the, the binary male, female, and the expectations and that we, uh, the, the traditional roles that were indoctrinated into our upbringing and American values where women were the mothers and the caretakers and they stay home and care for the children. And, and so it is a, it's been this long uh, transition from non-binary expectations. So it can get a little deep there, but it affects everybody because uh, it really is to see a, a human being that has a beard and is wearing a dress. It's really off-putting to many, um, but they're a human being. They're a human being. They have a heart, they have red blood, they have soul, and they have aspirations. So um, that's the long, tedious transition of respecting human beings on the planet, regardless of what they look like, how they dress, what language they speak, um, what faith they choose to practice. It's just respecting that human being and embracing who they want to identify as. It's a lot. It is. Uh, and also you have the, the whole idea of the, the corporations uh, and even the, the public institutions uh, being subject to the law, uh, state, and federal, uh, and, and mm -hmm. even local laws about discrimination. Uh, yeah. How do you deal with that from the, from the legal standpoint? Well, the, the discrimination cases, and this is the, um, the real challenge for all organizations, but specifically the military, because again, there's hundreds and hundreds of years, are the leaders are in charge of the disposition of cases. Um, certainly we have the law, we have to practice the Equal Opportunity Commission laws. Um, but there's a lot of bias that goes into just an employee going to a supervisor and saying, I feel discriminated against. And I, I feel like I'm not, I haven't been interviewed appropriately or I haven't been given the assignments to excel. 
um, a lot of it can stop right there with a leader, with a supervisor who's really listening to how that person is perceiving fairness and equal opportunity. Um, there's a long road from the time I feel offended or I feel discriminated against to I, I am made whole through the legal process. So there's so much more work we can do right at the human level, right at the supervisory level or the team leader, listening and hearing and valuing the person's perception of fairness. And it's tough. It's hard work. It's easy to say, just go back to work. Just disregard it, you know. I, I don't care how he's treating you, just go to work, get your job done. It, it's tough, there's a balance there of um, some people making uh, complaints that are invalid, but yet they need to be validated through the supervisor. And so, yeah, the, the legal road, and I'll, and I'll say um, EEOC, if you go to eeoc.gov site, 80% of sexual harassment cases in the military are unsubstantiated. It's really hard to prove that whether it's sexual harassment or gender discrimination, that it actually uh, was in a legal act. And, uh, so that's just tough. It's very, it's a great deterrent to just sucking it up and going on and putting it in your backpack and just saying, oh, well, that's the way it is. And so, yeah, changing the culture is, it's a tough job. Mm -hmm. I want to mention for uh, briefly, you're, you have a website, uh, uh, www.itsallaboutego.com. Uh, uh, yes. Make sure that people see that and uh, uh, describes uh, your activities and your program. And, and let's talk a little, a little bit about that. Uh, it is outlined in the website, and uh, it's always nice to have that uh, as a reference uh, with the recording and uh, on the show. Tell us about uh, what uh, services or what activities you do in yeah. referencing that website? Well, what I'm hoping uh, through the uh, diversity consulting business is what it is. And that is any, any organization or any team uh, or company that recognizes that, that they're having challenges in diversifying their teams, uh, law enforcement, a lot of uh, traditional construction con uh, occupations, they say, well, we want more women, but they don't apply. And so a lot of times um, it really just takes uh, conversations with the leadership there and the recruitment team to find out what are the strategies, what are the challenges and the barriers that you're having as to why you don't have more gender diversity in your teams and in your, in your um, business. And uh, they can be very subtle things. They can be, uh, you know, challenging things, but, um, if we don't roll up our sleeves and take a look at it, then nothing changes. So that's what uh, I'm hoping uh, through workshops, through keynote presentations, through education, I could help leaders, I could help teams um, increase the representation of their gender diversity in their businesses. And um, yeah, and really just help build team synergy among uh, men and women, uh, uh, the people of a business. Tell us about these uh, facilitated discussions. Uh, how do they work? And, and these workshops. Give us an example of how that works. Okay, well, um, Cheryl Sandberg, who wrote the book Lean In, uh, she started this um, kind of way of having conversations around gender diversity. And I did that in the guard too, where we would just have small groups of teams and really just talk about. And a lot of men who joined the circles were really. Um, surprised at, I didn't realize by me saying that, that I was shutting you down. And so they were very, very helpful in just having open conversations about a lot of times when you're offended or you feel like you're ignored, you don't say anything. You just kind of deal with it. You might say it to your, your partner or a friend, but you don't say it to the person who's actually offending you. So the facilitated discussions are a way of getting teams together to cross talk about the way that they treat each other and the things that are saying that are, are um, really turning people off, but they're not really saying it. And they're under working, you know, and under contributing when they don't feel safe. And so facilitate discussions are a way to bring teams together, have these conversations and improve uh, the way that we interact with each other. It really helps a lot. 
and how is this followed up? Let's say you do have a, a presentation to a corporation or another body, uh, and, and you have a workshop, you have uh, facilitated discussions, and you yourself speak to them, you're often a speaker. Uh, how do you follow that up? Well, obviously the leadership team uh, can follow it up through uh, having an open forum with their team and asking how things are going, but there's climate assessments that can be done uh, through anonymous surveys and just, just going back and revisiting the group and getting feedback from the employers and saying, you know, things have been much better since we had the workshop or now that we have these monthly facilitated discussions. Um, and, and, and in my experience in the guard for over a year, we had monthly lean in sessions and the, those who participated and had come to the lean ins, they all said that um, it improved, it improved their communication skills to go back to their work centers and really just um, uh, speak up when they really felt uh, there was some offensive term that was being used or they were uh, being sidelined and they found strength and tools to use to actually say something versus just just carry it yeah how do you uh, uh, try to achieve a balance between uh, someone who feels that they they, they don't have the self-esteem enough to deal with this or that maybe they just get too much in other words a balance between always complaining or not complaining or just letting it go uh, uh, yeah. how do you achieve that kind of balance that seems difficult well, again, I think uh, the leadership of an organization or a company um, creating that space where um, there is support around that. Um, oftentimes, like an employee feels all alone with the problem. And again, you can take it to your uh, partner or your friend outside of work, but that doesn't really help you in the work center. So it's really leaders establishing that network of support to talk about discrimination, to talk about being offended to talk about not being included. And so that's what facilitated discussions are, is they, the leadership says, this is important that we carve out some time and we create a space to talk about what's impacting your ability to um, do a great job and feel good about coming to work. Because uh, even Change the Story says that 70% of people who are sexually harassed change jobs. And so that's a great loss to employers. That's a great loss economically to a person to change a career and start over somewhere else. And so if we can solve the problem within the company, they don't have to leave. They're not impacted and the company's not impacted. So it really is carving out time to talk about the human barriers um, that are preventing people from feeling totally embraced and valued for what they bring to the team, so. We're getting uh, towards the conclusion, but I'd like to focus on uh, your book. Tell us about that. Uh, well, my book is called, um, right now, it's called Life at Camp. And it really is um, sort of my, my story of my experience of joining the military at 18 as a truck driver and a very uh, male dominated type of occupation in the army. Um, but then I joined the National Guard after active duty. And so it really, uh, it takes the reader on a story of how I ended up as the state equal employment manager and really came to find that um, sexism was a real problem, not just for myself, and, um, but for, for, for so many of the, of the service members. And so it really, uh, it's a call to action that the culture of the military needs to transition to a military that is not male dominated, that it is men and women who protect our democracy. And we need the values of all people, all characteristics, feminine, masculine, to have a great militia. And um, so I'm, I'm very excited about writing it. And I feel like it's not just talking about the problem, but it's talking about a possible solution and how each individual can be part of the solution so that's great well, that sounds very exciting and uh what, what do you have on your agenda next after the book is there any kind of seminar well well i'm going to enjoy retirement and uh you know playing with my granddaughter but um the book and just uh whenever i have an opportunity to serve 
to help teams, like I said, recognize uh, the gender biases that impact our everyday, um, you know, the, the value of our teams. And so that's what I'm working on. I'm also working on um, a bill, it's called H401 with Jean O'Sullivan, Representative Jean O'Sullivan. And that is, um, we're working on getting that bill passed, which would require the Adjutant General of the Vermont Guard um, to work with a diversity manager on gender equality, because we see the correlation between the representation of women and the uh, number of sex-based offenses or discrimination cases. And so I would love to see um, the bill passed and you know, fully utilized, embraced by the Guard, not only Vermont, but it, the entire um, military um, really increased the representation of women in our command force structure. So I, I got a lot to do. <laughs> Great. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, this is uh, Dennis McMahon uh, for Positively Vermont. Our guest today has been uh, Doris Sumner, the president of Empowering Gender Opportunities. Uh, thank you for watching.